every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word of God using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, loving Father, for the privilege of studying together the Word of God, which is alive and powerful, which is sharper than a two-edged sword. Thank you that you have given it to us and designed for it to be studied and taught and understood under the power of the same filling of the same Spirit who is the author of the Scripture itself. And therefore, we commit to this time together to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for His glory. Amen. One of the important reasons that it is necessary for us to study the distinction between Israel and the church is because unless you understand that, you can be confused and confounded into thinking that the Christian life is something that it is not. Where, what is the source of the contention that the Christian way of life is morality? That the Christian way of life is tithing? The Christian way of life is corporate worship? Well, these and many other misconceptions come because of the fact that the Mosaic Law, which was given to Israel, is taken as the basis for the Christian way of life, saying that Israel was the Old Testament church, Therefore, the same things which were true of the Old Testament church are true of the New Testament church, and therefore they take these things and they apply them to the New Testament church, taking things which are absolutely and totally for another period of time and making them the means of executing what God has the believer to execute in this life. Now, we must understand the principle of precedent. The principle of precedent. Now, precedent simply means that which went before, that which preceded. And there's a clever little, what would you call it, a couplet? that you may have heard it sounds like it belongs in our theology and uh, talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament it says the new is in the old concealed the old is in the new revealed. Doesn't that sound nice? But that's not true. It fails to understand the true precedent. The Old Testament is the precedent for something. It is for the the uh, part of the doctrine of the hypostatic union. Now, for those who have just joined us by radio or television, I'm using a term, hypostatic union, which may be unfamiliar to you, unfortunately. 
I was in the store one day talking to someone and uh, about the distinctions of Grace Memorial Bible Church, and which I said that 99% of all Christians don't have the slightest idea as to what the hypostatic union is all about, and yet we teach it three times to the children in our prep school before they even get, uh, get through so that they understand what the hypostatic union is all about. The clerk, who was a Christian, swallowed hard and said, what is the hypostatic union? Well, I don't... I mean, she didn't know because she didn't go to a church that taught her. People don't understand the hypostatic union. So let me explain it to you so that you'll know as quickly as I can. It's a very intricate doctrine. But it comes from the Greek word hypostasis, which looks like this. H-U-P-O-S-T-A-S-I-S. -S. Hupo means under... And stasis means to place, to place under. And what actually took place is in the person of Jesus Christ, this is the doctrine of the hypostatic union, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, there are two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. without the admixture of these two natures. Very, very important. Jesus Christ is the God-man, but his deity could never spill over and help his humanity. He was the unique person of the universe. Now, in his hypostatic union, which began with the virgin birth, and of course the hypostatic union stays, remains, he will always be the God-man. Throughout all of eternity he will be the God-man, except that his humanity will be glorified humanity after his resurrection and ascension into heaven. It's glorified humanity. But from the virgin birth on, he remains the God-man, the unique person of the universe. Now, when he came to this earth in his hypostatic union, the pre he offered himself as Israel's Messiah. And as Israel's Messiah, the precedent was Old Testament prophecies and promises which were related to the Messiah. Therefore, he says in the, the great so-called Sermon on the Mount, he says, Do not think that I have come to abrogate the law. I have come to fulfill the law. For not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away till all be fulfilled. And as the Messiah, he came to fulfill that. And so the precedent for his offering himself and his life as the offered Messiah was found in the Old Testament. The church does not in any way look back to the Old Testament for its precedent. We do not look back to anything in the Old Testament except by way of illustration and application. Nothing in the Old Testament explains the Christian way of life. Nothing in the Old Testament tells you how to live the Christian way of life. The precedent for the church age is found in the hypostatic union. There is a precedent, and that is the hypostatic union. For you see, in the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, he utilized divine power in order to fulfill the plan of God for his life. And that's exactly how the church is to function. Under divine power to fulfill the plan of God for their lives. So the hypostatic union is very, very important. It's important for us to understand the principle of precedent. 
and therefore to put the Old Testament in its proper perspective, and even to put the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the proper perspective. We need to, to understand something about uh, the fact that the majority of the Gospels uh, would be related to the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies regarding Messiah. And therefore, they depend upon the precedent. That's why, for example, throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount, you keep reading these words. You have heard that it hath been said. That's precedent. You have heard in the precedent. But I say to you, which is the fulfillment of the precedent. But that has nothing to do with church. That has to do with the relationship of the Messiah to Israel. When it comes to the church age precedent, it goes back to the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who uh, in his humanity depended entirely upon the power of God, the Holy Spirit. So, in his humanity, in the hypostatic union, the Lord Jesus Christ executed the great power experiment. of the hypostatic union. And when he left, he gave us the great power experiment of the church age. Now, when we think of the word experiment, we have to define it very carefully. I mean, uh, an experiment is not necessarily something that is uh, performed to to discover a particular uh, outcome, although that may be one use of it. It, on the other hand, uh, can be an experiment to prove a particular theory or a particular uh, uh, assertion. Down in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, there uh, in the... Uh, Edison complex, there is a magnificent uh, botanical uh, garden. And in this botanical garden, uh, uh, Mr. Edison imported plants from all over the world. But he had a purpose in those. He was looking for a filament for his electric light bulb. And he, was, he tried absolutely everything that is imaginable uh, for, to use for that filament. And one of the things that he found was the very best for, uh, to use his filaments to glow when the electricity is harnessed and sent through it was bamboo. And so he made his early bulbs out of Bamboo, but not just any bamboo, the certain kinds of bamboo. And so he has in this botanical garden uh, all kinds of bamboo imported from all over the world that he took strips and made it into a filament to experiment to see which would work. But once it was discovered which would work, he made his light bulb, and in some of the buildings that are there, there is a continuing experiment to prove his theory. That is, they have these light bulbs which uh, are clear, and you can see the filament inside of them. They have been glowing ever since the time that Edison lived there in the southern part of Florida. That was his southern home. And only one burned out in the, in the laboratory. Only one has burned out. It's been a tremendous... Now, obviously, they're not light as light as these. Probably comparable to the glow of a candle. But you can get a lot of wicks in on those things. But uh, the point is that experiments are sometimes done to discover something, but very often they are done to prove something. And here's the, uses, the two usages. The Lord Jesus Christ experimented with the power, the great power experiment. He tried this out 
the uh, omnipotence of God, the Holy Spirit, and he declared that it works. The experiment that is going on in the church age is the demonstration of the fact that this power which is available from God does indeed uh, continue to work, not only for one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, but for multitudes of people who are known as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, this, grace power, this great power experiment is the first of the results of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We spent some time studying the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and looked at some passages of Scripture that are related to it. But the baptism of the Spirit uh, 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 is very, very important. It is the work of God the Holy Spirit in which He places the believing sinner into union with Jesus Christ. This is called positional truth. We are now said to be in Christ and over... 200 or over 130 times in Scripture, the New Testament, it refers to, to this. Now, this is unique. Never before in history has the baptism of the Holy Spirit ever taken place. The first time it took place was on the day of Pentecost, and uh, it will continue to go on throughout this entire church age until the day of the rapture of the church. And it is unique, for only during this church age uh, do we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And so the first result of this is uh, the extension of the great power experiment of the hypostatic union into the great power experiment of the church age. Our Lord Jesus Christ experimented with it. It worked, and he passes it on to believers in the church age here in the, uh, uh, between the, the days of Pentecost and the rapture. No other dispensation, no other believer at any other time in history has ever been able to utilize this power uh, that God has made available. And this means, of course, that the believer is not related to any of these other uh, dispensations. Now, this means, maybe I should say, that um, omnipotence is available today such as it has never been before and never will again afterwards. For the new species which, which is introduced by this, we, the second point is that the result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a new species of creation upon the earth, the royal family. We've already seen this. This new species which utilizes a new power source. A new power source. During the energy crunches, we have we heard that people are uh, moving for, to... We need new power sources. Uh, is nuclear power the solution? And some said yes, and others said, oh, goodness, no, we'll blow ourselves up. Uh, someone said, hey, well, we need a new source. Okay, can we, uh, and they're even talking about it today, can we take and place uh, alcohol into the gasoline and, and uh, even make uh, uh, a new, much alcohol from corn uh, so that we can replace uh, the uh, gasoline? We need a new power source. Uh, and there's discussion going on between environmentalists and non-environmentalists, et cetera, et cetera, the scientific and the environmental community, back and forth, uh, they're looking for a new source of power, a new source of power. Well, uh, we have a new source of power, a new source of power which is only operable uh, in the uh, church age. This church age from the rep Pentecost to the, to the rapture of the church a new source of power for a new species of creation. This new species of creation runs off of a new kind of power. And it will not operate under the old kind of power. You can't take and put sugar in the gas tank. Sugar is a source of energy, no question about it. 
And gasoline is a source of energy, no question about it. But they're not interchangeable. You can't take a drink of gasoline and get energy, whereas you can take a good slug of sugar and get energy in your body. The body will function off of this, and uh, the gasoline engine will function off of this, but the energy must be suited to the species. And so God has a new power source for a new species, and that is omnipotence, which has never, ever been available. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, about 50% of the theological errors in, uh, which are rampant today come from the ignorance of the uniqueness of the church age. You check around and ask people the, the, to give you the ten distinctions. There are ten things that are different, uh, that are true of the church age that have never been true of anything. See if you can get five. You're lucky to get one or two from the average Christian. They're so ignorant of these things. They have no idea of the ten unique distinctions of the church age. We're just we're dealing with the first one, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the creation of the royal family of God. So this is just the first of the ten. But they don't have any idea. And they don't care. Where does the rubber meet the road? I'll tell you where the rubber meets the road. In the power source. They are utilizing today the wrong source of power to try to live the Christian way of life. And they're destined for failure. Now, the, this omnipotence, which is available, is provided by the Trinity. Now, later on, you'll see one of the other distinctions. One of the other distinctions of the church-age believer is that never before has it ever been true, never will be it true again. You and I are indwelt by the, all three members of the Godhead. At this moment in time, if you're a believer... Right now, you are indwelt by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I'm going to prove it to you later on in Scripture. But I'm going to tell you now why you are indwelt by all three. The, to share their omnipotence. God the Father uh, shares His omnipotence with you through the portfolio of invisible assets which He has provided for you. God the Son uh, provides His omnipotence in guaranteeing the preservation and the perpetuation of human history so and, and holding this together so that you as a believer can function under the great power experiment of the Christian way of life. And people are always concerned about how terrible things are. That's how you demonstrate that you have a supernatural power. The idea that the, the, uh, the, the, the ideal life is one of simply a simplicity and tranquility is stupid. That is not the ideal life. The ideal life is in the midst of conflict and trouble and problems and difficulty. The believer is tranquil. He doesn't lose his head. He doesn't run around like a chicken with his head cut off. He doesn't move into panic palace. He doesn't come up with all kinds of idiotic human viewpoint solutions to the problems of life. He applies the ten problem-solving devices of the Christian way of life and is able to relax in the midst of whatever is going on. Because God the Son is perpetuating human history as a and holding the universe together as a demonstration that this power experiment really works. The omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit uh, is related to the residence and function into the divine dynasphere, that is, your own palace in which you move into, into which you move, uh, when you are filled or controlled with the Holy Spirit. And when you move into that palace, you are taking advantage of all of the omnipotence which is available to you from the source of the Word of God and God the Holy Spirit in His control of you. And by means of this, you execute the plan of God. And you relax. You relax. You walk by faith in who and what He is, and not by means of sight. You operate not by means of human perspicacity, human intelligence, human ability. You walk by means of supernatural ability, superhuman ability. Another uh, result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the perpetuation 
of our Lord's victory. The Lord Jesus Christ won the strategic victory in the angelic conflict at the cross. Satan was defeated at the cross of Calvary. The strategic victory was won. But there is also a tactical victory which is available for all members of his royal family. And the strategic victory of the angelic conflict is perpetuated in the tactical victory which is given to believers of the church age. The problem is so many believers are ignorant of spiritual advance. They never exploit the strategic victory into a tactical victory and therefore they're losers throughout their entire life. And, they, and the reason is they, they seek to perpetuate his tactical, strategic victory by means of human power rather than by means of supernatural power. And as a result of this, they're losers all of their life. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit guarantees that his victory is your victory if you utilize his power in your life. Another is the uh, is positional sanctification for all believers. Now, what does the word sanctification mean? Well, it's not some esoteric word. It simply means to be set apart for God. In a in an Orthodox Jewish home. They have certain plates for the holidays. And on some of those plates, a dairy product has never rested, never will. Those are set apart for certain of the, of the holidays. And uh, even in many of our homes, we have, you know, the, the everyday dishes and the china. And the china is only used for very, very special occasions. They're set apart for company we say. Well, the believer is set apart for God, first of all, positionally. Positionally means that we are in Christ, and that is what is a part of the result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are placed in Christ, which is our positional sanctification. We're in Christ. We can never change that. That is our position. We do have an experiential sanctification. And that is when we, are, when we confess sin, we use rebound, and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. At that point of time, we are experientially set apart for God. We have done what Romans 12:1 tells us. We place ourselves at the disposal of God. There is also such a thing as progressive sanctification, which is spiritual growth. The more you study, the more you grow, the more you are set apart for God. And then there is ultimate sanctification, which will take place in eternity future uh, when we are in reality, we are physically set apart for him forever and ever and ever. So you see, these others are, are part of sanctification, but this is the thing which is uh, the result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are positionally set apart for God. All right? Another result of the Holy Spirit is that every believer is now positionally higher than an angel. Now, remember that the word angel which is this Greek word, A-N-G-E-L-O-S, the two G's sound N-G, angelos, means messenger. Therefore, when we use the word angel, we are simply transliterating a Greek word into the English, and we're not explaining it. But angels were super beings. They are super beings. 
And the only thing that they have in common with man is, well, they had, was free will and volition. But man, you see, what happened in eternity past was God gave a volitional test to the angelic creation. We don't know what it was. We were not told what it was. We were told that it took place. The entire angelic creation was given an, a volitional test. One third went on negative volition and became what is known as fallen angels. We call them daimon or demons. They followed Lucifer, the highest archangel, who went negative. Two thirds of the angels went on positive volition and are called il elect angels. When God the Father sentenced these fallen angels to a place called the Lake of Fire, Satan, or Lucifer, comes, comes along and he challenges this. Lucifer says, how can a God of love send his creatures to this terrible place? And therefore, in order for God, which is his, that's his appeal, the appeal of his, his righteous sentence. And therefore, we enter into a new stage in the, in the trial. God make, creates an inferior being, inferior to angels in every way, except that he also has volition. This inferior being is called homo sapien, which is not a bad word, by the way. It simply means a member of the human race. This, this a homo sapien uh, has one thing in common with the angels. He is created inferior to the angels in every way. And our Lord Jesus Christ himself was created inferior to the angels, or was born, uh, I shouldn't say created, in his humanity, he was born inferior to angels. But by means of his strategic victory on the cross, he became superior to angels. So that from the time of the cross on, when our Lord Jesus Christ won that strategic victory on the cross, he has been superior to angels. And when he ascended into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father, where God the Father said, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies the footstool of thy feet. But remember, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not an ecstatic. It's not speaking in tongues. It's not an emotion. It is a work of the Holy Spirit in which the believer is placed, what? In union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Since we are in union with Christ, we are therefore positionally superior to angels. Even though in our physical being, we are still inferior positionally because we're in Christ. We are superior to angels. And one day, when the rapture does take place, we will be physically superior to angels just as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. Only in our resurrection body, however, will that take place. But in the meantime, what's thrilling is that because we are in union with Christ, because we are superior to angels... God has taken that superior creation and He has made them your servant. Isn't that something? You have an angel assigned to you. Now, don't look around. You can't see him. I know when I was a kid, somebody told me I had a guardian angel. I'd just like to see him. I never did see him. Can't see him. Angels are invisible. But God has assigned at least one. Uh, Hebrews 1 that deals with this whole subject, and 14 tells us that you have been assigned at, uh, at least one angel to guard you in this angelic conflict. So okay, you don't have to worry. You, you have an inside agent outside. You have the Holy Spirit inside. You have an angel outside. You're impregnable, folks. You're impregnable. You don't ever have to worry. Just relax in who and what Christ is. But because of this, you, can, uh, you, you have angels serving you. Oh, that's really that's good news. Another result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that because of union with Jesus Christ, you share all that he is and all that he has. Have you ever heard this word, joint heir? 
Now, joint heir does not mean if uh, that 50% uh, is yours and 50% is his. It means this. 100% belongs to both of you. That's what a joint heir is. And that means that all everything you have is his. And what is that? All you give him is your problems, your troubles, your uh, heartaches, your sorrows, your zero zero point zero zero your nothingness and your sins to take care of and what do you receive well uh, you re you first of all you share his eternal life first John 5 11 and 12 that is because Jesus Christ lives forever you will share that eternal life you share his righteousness because he is absolute righteousness you will be absolutely righteous as far as God is concerned. You are uh, when God sees you, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God where? In him. Absolute righteousness. When God sees you today, he doesn't see your sins. And Satan may come along and say, well, so that's a Christian, huh? Take a look at that one. Look what he did today. Look how she failed today. God throws the case out of court. Because you, he says, no, you see, that believer is clothed in the righteousness which belongs to Jesus Christ. A lot of people are confused about election. There's no problem at all. The Lord Jesus Christ was elect in eternity past, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, and we share his election. He was elected, and we, are, we, we go right along with him. And uh, this would be the coattails effect. <laughs> the coattail effect. We, we share his sonship. In uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, he is the son forever. And we, therefore, are sons of God in Christ. No longer uh, are, we, uh, are, are we servants. We are sons or daughters, children of God. We share his airship. He, uh, not A-I-R, but H-E-I-R, airship. That is, he is the heir of all things. And therefore, everything that belongs to him belongs to us, us as well. What is his destiny? Whatever it is, we share it. We will spend our destiny with him. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. That where I am, you will be also. Wherever he is, that's our destiny. It isn't related to a place. Remember that. A lot of believers are looking forward to go to heaven. That's wonderful. Our de destiny is not related to a place. It's related to a person. Where I am, you may be also. We share his sanctification, being set apart, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. We share his priesthood. That's why we are priests. We represent ourselves. You don't have a priest. I don't pray for you. You don't pray for me. Uh, I represent myself. You represent yourself. You're your own priest. But if you're a royal priest because he was a royal priest after the order of Melchizedek. Not after the order of uh, uh, Levi, a human priesthood, but a royal priest. And so you share that. Hebrews Chapter 10, verses 10 to 14. You and I represent ourselves to God because we share his priesthood. And we also share his kingship. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. We are royalty as well. 2 Peter 1, 11. All of these things are ours because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in which we are placed into union with Jesus Christ. Can you see why the charismatic movement is seeking to uh, uh, destroy the baptism of the Holy Spirit into some kind of an ecstatic movement of speaking in tongues when it has so much to say to us? Of course, if you want to destroy people, if you want to uh, delude people, lead them into thinking that the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is some kind of an ecstatic instead of what it is for all believers and what it does for them. Look at all these things, and we're not finished yet. Nine, the baptism of the Holy Spirit results in an equality which exists nowhere else in life. This is the only equality. It, it's sexual equality. The only place there is true equality between men and women is in the Lord Jesus Christ, in Him, in Him. It, 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 is, uh, it has to do with uh, racial equality. It has to do with cultural equality. It has uh, to do with uh, every kind of equality. Their only place where people are truly equal 
is not in the United States of America, but at the foot of the cross. For Galatians uh, tells us uh, that because of union with Jesus Christ, we all have equal privilege and equal opportunity as members of the body of Christ, the royal family of God, and there's nobody any better than anybody else. We are all at the foot of the cross exactly the same. Ten, this also provides for us eternal security. That is, you are placed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's no way that anybody or anything can ever get you out of Jesus Christ. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of the most glorious things that we can teach, and it is a very important principle that is brought out as one of the ten things that is unique to the church age. There are ten things that is true of this age between the day of Pentecost and the rapture of the church that is, that is not true of any other dispensation. No matter when it took place, it is not true of any other dispensation. And the first thing is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which results in the, a new species on the earth, and that new species is the royal family or body of Christ. So there you have the first two. The third thing that is unique to the church age is the protocol plan of God. Now, God has always had a plan. The Old Testament had a ritual plan of God, which was given to his people, Israel. But now, in the new dispensation, the dispensation of the church age, we have a protocol plan of God. Now remember, we always have to define the word protocol because we don't live in a society where protocol has a great deal of importance. We're so informal here that we call President Bush George. You know, but in uh, in a society where they have uh, uh, ranks and they have uh, different things, we find that protocol is defined as a rigid, a long established code and procedure. For God's royal family, prescribing, what does it prescribe? What does it tell us? Complete deference to superior rank and authority, followed by strict adherence to due order and precedence. coupled with a precisely correct procedure. Now, it seems like we have to, that this is pedantic, but it is, it is important. But here's the point. Why, 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 do we, why is it called a protocol plan of God? Well, listen. God is perfect. A perfect God cannot come up with an imperfect plan. That the perfect God must have an absolutely perfect plan. Now, if there is a perfect plan, then there ha in that perfect plan calls for a proper procedure in order to execute that perfect plan. It, it isn't uh, uh, this... Uh, the uh, lackadaisical kind of a thing. Uh, well, do it any way you want. You know, do the best you can. Uh, it'll all come out all right. Now, God says that I have a, per a, a, a particularly perfect plan, and I have a proper way to execute that plan. Uh, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end therefore thereof are the ways of death. Now, of course, it refers to salvation in that situation. 
can, it doesn't make any difference how sincere a person is. There's only one way to heaven. There is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way of salvation. Is God narrow? Absolutely God is narrow. God says there's only one way of salvation. It isn't just a matter of doing the best you can or you know, following the light that you have or uh, different religions being different roads that lead to heaven or uh, uh, God taking all the good things you've done, putting them on one side of the scale, the bad things on the other, and if the good outweighs the bad, you get to heaven. Uh, that's not right. Those are man's methods or laying on a bed of spikes and by which means you please God or killing off all Christians, which is the way the Muslim will please God, or whatever it may be. No, no. There's only one way that God has set for getting to heaven. And there's only one way to execute His plan. And therefore, it's called a protocol plan. It has a rigid, long-established code and procedure prescribing complete deference to superior rank, that's His, for superior authority, that's His authority, followed by a strict adherence to due order and precedence, coupled with a precisely correct procedure. In other words, during our time on the earth, the royal family, God tells us how we are to execute His plan. And it's found in a specific place. It's found under what is called the mystery doctrines of the church age, which are the New Testament epistles. It isn't found in the Old Testament. There's not one word in the Old Testament how to live the Christian way of life. Very little is said in the Gospels of how to live the Christian way of life. How to live the Christian way of life is revealed in the mystery doctrines of the church age, which are found in the epistles. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 to 6 makes it extremely clear. Now, that means that the right way and the wrong way to execute the plan of God have to be given to us clearly. And they are in the Word of God, in the mystery doctrines of the New Testament or the sacred secret of the epistles. This is where God has given it. Not out in nature, not in philosophies, not in science, not in mathematics, not in any other uh, place would you find the, di di the distinction between what's right and what's wrong as far as executing the plan of God. Now, we're not talking about uh, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how one executes God's perfect plan. Now, everyone will admit that a wrong thing done in a wrong way is wrong. Everyone says, well, I know that. But suppose we do a wrong thing in a right way. It's still wrong. Suppose we do a right thing in a wrong way. It's still wrong. There's only one thing that's right. A right thing done in a right way is the only way that's right. And this is the protocol plan of God. God has given a unique and wonderful plan, and it's the right plan, and He tells us the right way to execute it. And the first thing that He tells us is that since God is perfect, and His plan is also perfect, therefore, and uh, that this plan can be executed only by means of a perfect power. Now, since this plan has as its beneficiary imperfect people, that's you and me, and every member of the human race, he makes something very clear, that there can be no contribution by imperfect people to this plan if it's going to come out correctly. 
which, which eliminates human ability. It eliminates human intelligence. It eliminates human works, human power, human energy, human talent. All of these things are excluded, therefore, from the plan of God. And yet this is the baggage that all of us bring with us. And we want to, we want to bring along some of that stuff into the plan. Say, now look, God, uh, uh, I, I have a great, a tremendous talent. Let me tell you something. God may utilize a particular talent that you have, but not, not, not to fulfill or execute the plan of God. It's not to execute the plan of God. It may be uh, uh, used in some way to uh, testify, to, to make for extra purpose. Let's say you have a, a talent to sing. 99% of all musicians are very temperamental. 90% temper, 10% mental. Not true of ours, but true. And they want everyone to know what a great singer they are. That's why I have such great admiration for George Beverly Shea. When he sings at the Billy Graham Crusades, he doesn't find and sing the Holy City. The Holy City is a... Is, is a uh, it doesn't mean a thing. I mean, so what? Once again, the scene was changed. <laughs> It's a pretty song, but there's no gospel in it. There's no gospel message. It doesn't talk about Christ dying for our sins. Bev Shea has selected throughout all of his life a simple gospel song. He doesn't have the best voice, and he's the first one to admit it. But God has used him immeasurably down through the years. He doesn't, the talent, you don't, you don't look at it and say, Lord, here, I bring all my talent to you. Now to, no, no. You leave everything behind, utilizing the perfect power that God provides, the power of the Word of God, Bible doctor, the Word of God is alive and powerful, and the power of the omnipotence. You, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the perfect power, and the only perfect power, which is used in the plan of God. And so you, you execute it without any human ability, human power, human personality, human works, uh, all of these things are excluded. You leave them behind and execute the perfect plan of God by means of His provision of perfect power. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ used that perfect power in His humanity during the hypostatic union. We talked about it already. And we use it also in our lives. So, the... Uh, the unique protocol plan of God which has been provided for us by God and is revealed only in the Word of God. The, 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 the Word of God reveals all that we have available to us. Beloved, I don't know if you realize what you have available to you today that the men and women of the Old Testament, as great as they were, did not have available. Unprecedented in the past dispensations, unprecedented in future dispensations. No plan comes anywhere near the protocol plan of God for the provision of believers for living the Christian way of life. And yet so many believers are relying on some kind of a gimmick system, human personality, talent, ability, power. Uh, uh, somebody wrote a book on uh, success and they're following that means of success. Grace means that if God demands it, God must provide it, and He has. We can't deserve anything from God. God's work must be supported by God's riches. And God provides it in grace. And we have so much, we have so much in unprecedented power, unprecedented blessing, unprecedented blessing. Nothing that the energy of the flesh can provide for us comes anywhere near what God has provided. It's rather amazing to me that arrogant believers expect to know all these things without spending any time studying them. 
Remember, if we were all born spiritually brain dead, and we were, and in a total state of ignorance regarding God and His plan, just as we need to learn a language to think as children, we can't even think until we learn the language. Once we learn the language, then we can think. Well, in order to orient to life in general, we have to learn the language. How in the world can we learn the spiritual life just by some osmosis process, and then now I'm born again, give it to me, God. No, it's found in the Word. It must be studied carefully, time in and time out, time out, here a little, there a little, building line upon line, precept upon uh, precept. And another thing is that no believer can execute the plan of God through someone else's soul. You can't depend on your pastor. You can't depend on your wife or your husband. You can't depend on a counselor to give you uh, information. You must have it inside your own soul from the Word of God. Otherwise, you'll live, try to live on someone else's soul it means you're going to be walking through life on crutches and you'll never ever stand on your own two feet. And therefore, you, will, you need to receive accurate Bible teaching and in your own privacy, for personal privacy of application, and you must have the opportunity to personally and privately apply the Word of God, which is taught to you, so that you can function. Well, we'll pick up the, the other uh, uh, seven uh, uh, characteristics uh, of the, that are unique to the church age uh, as we continue our study uh, in our next class. Now, thank you, loving Father, for the privilege which is ours of being in the royal family of God by means of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. May God the Holy Spirit take the things which we have studied and make them a source of great blessing to us. And may we all go home appreciating what you have done for us uh, in providing for us these wonderful things on the basis of your grace and your grace alone. In Jesus' name, amen.